Hello, welcome back to the Stitching Scotland Story podcast. On this episode, we're joined by author Claire Hunter, as well as the coordinator and lead stitcher for the tapestry, Dory Wilkie. Today, we will be sitting down with Claire and Dory to talk about the hidden stitches found both within the tapestry panels and within Scottish history. Thank you both for joining. Um, if you can start by introducing yourselves and uh, your relationship to the tapestry or tapestry work. My name's Dory Wilkie and I was the stitch coordinator on the Press and Pans tapestry which led on to being stitch coordinator for the Great Tapestry of Scotland. And I'm Claire Hunter. Uh, I was originally a community textile artist and now turned writer. I've done two books that are about the meaning of uh, textiles. And I was a stitcher on a tiny part of the Great Tapestry of Scotland. Wonderful. So we have two stitchers here today. So Claire, the theme of this episode is very much exploring the link between storytelling and needlework, uh, particularly those of secret stitches. Uh, you're, you've crafted a beautifully insightful story about Mary Queen of Scots and her use of embroidery throughout her lifetime. Um, and you cover this in your book, Embroidering Her Truth, Mary Queen of Scots in the Language of Power. Mary excelled at embroidery and sewing, and during her time in captivity had created messages which were um, through images, symbolism, and uh, words in her needlework. So can you tell us a bit more about this period of her history and why you chose to tell this story? Uh, well, I chose to, to tell the story because really in that late Renaissance time, then textiles captured the spirit of the age. Um, they were, you know, every, in, in palaces and courts particularly, then, you know, every um, surface was a site for propaganda to basically promote lineage, allegiances, um, um, erudition, etc. And women really adopted textiles as, an, as another form of agencies, not just by what they displayed, where they were, what they wore, but also by what they made, because at that point, um, embroidery was moving out of the ecclesiastical hands into more secular hands, and the women of the court had greater access to fine needles and fabrics that were easier to embroider. So they took up embroidery as another form of writing, really. And Mary was part of that movement of women's agency through textiles. And that's something that pulls through, I think, with the tapestry as well, because it's predominantly stitched by women, which story I think you could speak to. It was well. predominantly stitched by women, uh, although there were uh, partners and men who did get involved. But there was also the network around those stitchers who gave advice on the subject or um, researched on their behalf and that was all adding to the input of the design of the total panel. The panels themselves are absolutely, they're stunning. I know of me being a main stitcher, I was often um, told the stories about the side panels as well which are on the tapestries. So can you speak a bit about the process of sort of bringing these tapestries to life and as a stitcher yourself and how that kind of came together? When a group received their kit, which mm -hmm. is what we called um, a pack that had traced linen, uh, some wools and suggested colours, stranded cottons, and three pages of sort of suggestions on how to outline, perhaps, and filling stitches. They weren't directions, they were just suggestions. And um, a list of stitches that maybe some people hadn't thought about. But you have to remember that each panel wasn't stitched necessarily by stitching groups. There were hobby groups, walkers, cyclists, canoeists, uh, people who met, maybe met in autumn. So we had different levels of expertise, which was lovely. And I'm sorry, Dory, when you started out, did you expect that kind of range of people to get involved? I was hoping for that range because mm. on the Preston Pants Tapestry, we had predominantly stitchers, but it was ladies of a certain age who had worked, who had learnt at school mm. or from the grannies, but had had never used it because of course you have to raise your families and do jobs mm. and all this sort of aspect. So stitching isn't really a hobby that's um, pursued now, decorative stitching. Um, although you do obviously get textile artists mm. and that's, a, yeah. Um, also they got the panel and the groups would meet together and perhaps divide the panel up into areas. I don't know if you did that. And people agreed to stitch certain areas, but then they had to decide as a group on the colour. 
to use or um, what kind of stitches to use. And then eventually a group leader would emerge and the group leader made sure that the panel was in somebody's hands all the time because one group got their panel done in three months. So there was 18 months from beginning to end, but they didn't have their panels for 18 months. It was good to get somebody to stick, not go on holiday and leave it lying, do nothing in the house, which happened. Um, and some panels went on holiday to the Great Wall of China, to New York, to various places, so they could keep stitching away. Um, so that had to be all agreed within a group, and groups, by their nature, are different people, so they all had to... So you'd be aware of that, Claire, obviously, yes, with all absolutely. your previous work. That, they, they, they had to agree all these things and um, keep in contact with myself or another lady called Gillian. And because I, I didn't want the whole group contacting me, I needed a leader to sort of bring their woes or requests for rules or arrangements to come and see us in the studio I was using. So yes, it was quite a, 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 an organisational thing for the groups to go through. Certainly so. And you sort of touched on this, Claire, I wanted to ask you that in your promotion of needlework, um, you were involved in other initiatives. Um, which was using sewing as a way to celebrate local history, which is another form of storytelling, certainly, as well, and to document uh, community experiences. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I'd been a community artist for many years, and then in the 1980s, in a sense, turned political. And at that point, it was you know, Green and Common, it was the minor strike, it was March for Jobs, and I started to use my needlework skills, which I'd learned as a child, to sew banners. Mm -hmm. And I just thought there was something so fantastic about these large textile public works that I decided to then set up in Glasgow a community textile enterprise called Needleworks and the idea of that was to work with um, different communities mostly communities who were marginalised in different ways through culture or poverty um, and create with them large-scale textile works that would tell of their history, their concerns um, and in a sense uh, promote their imagination and creativity and skills but to make sure that those textiles were seen in a public place. Um, and the kind of the, the most um, the, the high point of Needlework's time was really in, in Glasgow's Year of Culture in 1990, where uh, we devised a, a project called Keeping Glasgow in Stitches. And that involved uh, 600 people actually working to make 12 15 foot high uh, banners that told of the story and spirit of Glasgow. But it was made in public in Kelvin Grove Art Gallery Museum. And uh, all sorts of different people, and like Joy was saying, we'd, you know, we had surgeons from Glasgow Infirmary coming to yeah. work in it, we had policemen, we had um, uh, all sorts of different people came to work on those banners. So it really was made by all sorts of people from the city um, and was much celebrated. That's incredible. And so your, both of your backgrounds seem to be, you had learned stitching in school. Uh, from my mother. Oh, okay, from your mother. And Dory, for yourself? I uh, started stitching in the late 60s, early 70s, which kind of dates me, uh, making maxi coats and things. So I, I was interested in stitching, sewing clothes for myself. But then I went to an exhibition that City and Guild students had put on in art and design and embroidery, which was at that time in Telford College in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And I just loved the use of all these different textiles, and they weren't all textiles, plastics, wires, everything. And I thought, I'm going to have to do this. So my kids were quite young, but I was very lucky, and I went and did four years there. And I thought, nope, I've done four years, I'm going to do art now. But actually, I, I then went to work as a librarian in the vet school, and I saw if, I, my husband asked if I would retire early. So I did retire. And I, I'm restless, so I found flyers, and one of the flyers was for the art Four Harbours Art Festival, looking for stitchers to make a tapestry. So I became all sniffy, and I said, "Well, how can you stitch a tapestry?" <laughs> and then, which of course leads on to that question of when's a tapestry a tapestry? Uh, so I volunteered, I went along, and I kept asking questions, and eventually. Gordon, the Baron of Preston Grange, said, would you be the stitch coordinator? And I said, well, yes, but I don't know what that meant, but I do know now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And okay. you've done it twice over now. And I've done it twice over okay. working with Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. So and I'm just curious that you said, when is a tapestry a tapestry? When is a tapestry a tapestry? Well, generally both are also telling stories. Um, with tapestries, they're weaving the story right through. And with surface embroidery, in this case, Great Tapestry of Scotland, they're telling the story of the history of Scotland. So there's a link there. Yes. Oh, that's a lovely way to put that as well. So I'm very curious about these ideas of secret stitches because I kept hearing this um, from my visits at the tapestry. And then, of course, I um, came into contact with, with your work as well. And I would like you both, if you can, just to talk about these secret stitches. So, Dory, I would like to hear about it from the panels itself. And then, um, Claire, you were sort of already mentioning about um, how stitching was political. And I know that Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, rumor had it that she was sort of transferring messages and stuff, which was a supposed uh, thing. So if you could just speak a bit about that to our listeners as well, that would be great. So we can start with you, Claire. Yes, well, Mary's stitching wasn't necessarily secret, but it was um, um, symbolic and at times subversive. Um, so I can give you a couple of examples. Her, yes. her embroidery of a cat, which you can go and see in the Palace of Holyrood House, for instance, uh, which she, the original um, source was a, a woodcut, a black and white woodcut from Conrad Gesner who was a, a botanist and a naturalist. Um, then basically what Mary t- did with that illustration was she turned her cat into a, a kind of brown red to personify it as the red-haired Queen Elizabeth I. And then into that picture, which wasn't in Conrad's, uh, Conrad Gesner's original, she then inserted a little mouse, um, which was in fact a personification of herself, scurrying by the cat's paws, slightly terrified. And in Mary's depiction of it, the, the, mouse, the cat's paw is very firmly placed on the mouse's tail to stop it escaping. So in that little picture, which looks completely charming, of just a little cat and mouse, and obviously you've got the fable about the cat and mouse, then Mary was actually then making a comment about her own predicament in captivity. Um, and then another one that she did when she was plotting to marry the Duke of Norfolk uh, in England, uh, who was the most uh, powerful man in, uh, in the country at the time, uh, then she embroidered him a cushion cover, uh, which appears to be, again, a hand from descending from the heavens holding a pruning knife with which it's pruning away some old vine to allow the younger vine to flourish. But, of course, the old vine, which uh, isn't bearing fruit, is the virgin queen, Elizabeth I, and the fecund vine is Mary, who had already given birth to James V. And she has various symbols of, of Catholic victory uh, as symbols on, on the banner. Two b- little birds winging free, which presumably were her and Norfolk, and various other boasts of fertility in its borders. Now, that cushion was actually sighted. Norfolk was, uh, they were plotting to uh, marry, to mm-hmm. overthrow Elizabeth, and to turn England to, back to Catholicism. And when that plot was discovered, then Norfolk was put on trial. The cushion was actually, cushion cover was cited in his trial for treason. Uh, and while Norfolk himself was then executed, then they couldn't prove, because of the kind of ambiguity in the, the symbolism of the day, they couldn't actually prove that Mary was implicated through that cushion, at least in treason. Um, but it shows that, as I say, it wasn't exactly secret but her stitching was ambiguous. I do love that. That is a rich story. And um, Dory, so the panels were given over to the stitchers and um, I was told on several occasions on visits to the tapestry that there are um, stitches that the, um, the, the stitchers that themselves would put in that kind of gave it an extra layer of um, character. So I'm calling them secret stitches in the sense that most people wouldn't know these things. So can you share some stories? They again aren't as secret mm-hmm. as you know we, you're portraying. But at, um, when they got their panels, all the all the stitchers researched the subject that they had, and they were to um, offer ideas to put in the boxes roundabout, relating to the subject and or of the time of the subject. Um, and in some cases, people had local history that um, they could add to their their panels. Um, and I was just going to tell you uh, that every single panel, the stitchers did this, so I, you, you'd be here till next year. <laughs> but um, uh, St Margaret of Scotland, the group there, lived in Dunfermline, and the panel was deliberately allocated to them. 
and they researched um, the the panel and they've put in the mason's mark in Dunfermline Abbey um, that the, the head mason had worked on and he had also worked in Durham Cathedral. Um, so, the, you know, it's linking things like that and not everybody can notice these on the panel, so that's sort of secret. Um, but at the bottom, um, where their signatures are, and that's probably where um, there's more meaning in, in, in a lot, but not all, um, their tags, I call them that. And in this particular one, there are rondels at the bottom. And in one, there's a casket um, that um, Queen Margaret, which the stitchers like to call her, because she wasn't canonised for many years after um, she died. Um, round about her seven martlets, which are flightless birds, and they're each the number of each of the stitchers on the panel. Mm. And on the other side, um, there's symbols of Margaret. She was called the Pearl of Scotland, so there's a little pearl. And there's a black rood, and then there's a scallop shell for the pilgrims that went to Dunfermline. And then there's her prayer book symbolised, and she lost it, and it was found in a burn, running water, and her husband Malcolm got it recovered in gold and embedded jewels into it, and it's still in the Bodleian Library, but without the jewels and the gold cover. <laughs> so it's things like that that they were all doing, each one. Um, the Indian head, for example, um, they've included the effects Scots had out in India, the different companies, um, there's a stylized plant going all the way around to represent the botanists that went out. Um, there are bagpipes, a wee teapot. There's all sorts of things, that, uh, um, the opium trade, the silk, butterfly. They did some cantha stitching, which is a very simple stitch, but if you juxtapose one row after the other, you, get design, you can make designs. So they've included all of this and they worked on that themselves. So Andrew just did the central image and then they would find and then run it past us both and we would okay it. Hmm. So that's just a taster. <laughs> Which one's your favourite panel or your favourite story inside the panel? Well, I think I have to say Mary Queen of Scots, who went, um, and I love the fact that um, the, the stitches of that panel have included little motifs from her embroidery and that she herself is embroidery. Yes. You know, so so it just um, you know, because my book is about that, then it obviously is the one that touched me most. But I've got other favourites. I, I I actually was very moved by you know quite a lot the ones in Flodden, Glencoe, and the Great Depression. Again, it's extraordinary that you can get a mood through stitching. Yes, and absolutely. they do capture a mood, and so I love those. But also, I was very intrigued by. The industrial ones, which surprised me, because again, you think those kind of imageries of machinery, etc., you know, be that the locomotives, be that the shipbuilding, would um, not um, lend themselves to being embroidered. Yes. But actually, in terms of both Andrew's designs and the way the stitches have used that, you get a sense of weight, you get a sense of mm. actual movement within the machinery, you know, so they've got an energy in them. Uh, so I, I love those as well. That's great. And where can people find your books? Oh, they can find my books in any good uh, independent bookshop or um, any, any or online, yes. And in the Great Tapestry of Scotland gift shop as and well. And in the Great Tapestry <laughs> of Scotland believe. gift shop, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Dory, what was your favourite panel or story? I can't say what my favourite panel was or I'd be lynched, but <laughs> um, every time the panels came back, it was like a reward. We would look at the the panels and the textures and the stitching and we were aghast in places, you know, and as picking up from what Claire was saying about industrial panels, um, the mining one is a very moving one because it was stitched by the wife, daughter and granddaughter of a miner and the image of his head became him. And she did tiny, tiny stitches all over his chin and uh, like a beard. And she said, that's how we saw him all the time. And his helmet um, has a pictorial image of the peace tin they got, the soap they were given, and the number on his tag when he went down the mine. And in the corners, they have it stitched um, daffodils, 
in memory of him because the last time she saw him, he gave her daffodils. Oh. And it's so touching. Oh. That's very sweet. Oh, well, thank you both for joining. Um, this has been delightful and we learned thank a lot more about the stitches and this, the history of stitching as well. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, you. thank you for joining us on this episode of Stitching Scotland's Story. Be sure to tune in next time where I'll be joined by Noelle Campbell, Visit Scotland's Scottish Connections Manager. Noelle and I will be discussing the Scottish diaspora, the stories that connect us, and of course, the great tapestry of Scotland. <laughs>